Hey, Deserving Listeners, I'm going to do one of my favorite things, which is to answer patron emails. So let's get to it. This first email is from upper tier patron Bronwyn, friend of the podcast, good old Bronwyn, says, can you talk about Amanda Berry? She was one of the three girls kidnapped for 10 years, chained and assaulted, and then Amanda gave birth to the kidnapper's child's kidnapper's child while being locked up. She escaped to become an advocate for missing people, and many have been found due to her advocacy. Also, Jerry Conlon. He was imprisoned for a bombing he did not commit. He became an advocate for human rights up until he died. There are many such humans like these. These people are heroes to me. I want to hear why some people maintain sanity during enormous hardship, imprisonment, and justice, and do not go mad, but instead make a positive difference in the world. Can you talk about the greatness of the human spirit within the bigger picture of personality disorders and trauma? End of email. Yeah, so great question, Bronwyn. I could go on and on about this in a lot of different ways, but I thought the way that I would do it would be to talk about Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl is known in my field of psychotherapy as, as one of the greats. He has an interesting backstory that led him to his model of therapy called logotherapy. I did a whole deep dive on this back in 2017 for patrons only called Viktor Frankl and Logotherapy. But I thought I would just briefly talk about or summarize his life as a response to this, because he's someone that not only went through great hardship and then became a hero to a lot of therapists, but he also studied this. He actually not only studied it in the extreme as people go through extreme hardship and then how do they get through it, but also how that applies to all of us, because all of us are going through hardship. So Viktor Frankl. Um, born in 1905 in Vienna uh, to a Jewish family. He became interested in psychiatry as a teenager. At the time, Freud would have been just emerging into his popularity, and he, Viktor Frankl, reached out to Freud, and Freud agreed to become his mentor in psychoanalysis and psychiatry. Later in his career, Viktor Frankl, 1930s, As a psychiatrist, he worked a lot with suicidal people. He found that suicidal people tend to have a sense of, uh, he found that suicidal tend not to have a sense of meaning in their lives. He he found that, you know, what's, what is it about suicidal people that makes them different from people who don't think about suicide all the time? And he found that for people who thought about suicide, that they just didn't have any apparent meaning, any purpose. In Vienna, apparently there were a lot of college kids killing themselves after getting bad grades at the time, particularly women. So Viktor Frankl set up a free suicide counseling service, which reportedly drastically reduced the suicide rate in Vienna. This is, the, this is his first discovery that would become the germ of what he would later call logotherapy and existential therapy um, as a broader topic. He contributed to existential therapy pretty significantly. Essentially, this question of why do we carry on? What is it about some people that just gets them up in the morning and perseveres in the face of difficulty? And how do we manage to get through suffering in life? Because, you know, all, all of life is suffering. So he's working with suicidal people. He's in his early career. And then, 1938, Nazi Germany invades Austria. Jewish people were rounded up and imprisoned and tortured and killed, mass genocide, we all know this. And Viktor Frankl and his family being Jewish, uh, he and his family avoided the camps because he was useful to the Nazis because he was a psychiatrist. And he became chief of neurology at a hospital. He continued working with suicidal people. At the time, Nazis were rounding up the mentally ill and killing them, but Viktor Frankl worked against the Nazis by misdiagnosing his patients so they would be categorized as suffering from a minor issue instead of a major mental issue so they wouldn't be killed by the Nazis. Like if someone had schizophrenia or suffering from schizophrenia, 
he would diagnose them with a loss of speech, which was apparently less severe. So he saved a lot of patients' lives through this action. A few years later, 1942, by now many Jewish people were seeing the writing on the wall and decided to emigrate west to get away from the Nazis to avoid being rounded up and killed. And he got a visa that allowed him to leave the country to escape Nazi Germany, Nazi Austria. Uh, Austria. But his parents did not get a visa. They tried and failed. So they had to stay in Austria. And he didn't know what to do. Then he decided to remain, uh, or no, he's sorry, I'm looking at my notes here. Uh, he was reminded of the fourth commandment to honor your parents. And he thought, you know what? If I leave my parents here, that would be a bad thing. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay with my parents knowing that bad things can happen to me, but I can't abandon my parents in this situation. And then soon after that, he and his pregnant wife were rounded up and put in the infamous Auschwitz, Auschwitz, Auschwitz camp. Auschwitz camp. I don't know why it's hard for me to say. I, I, by the way, I, I just recently watched Schindler's List again. It's such a good movie. Um, in the camps, as you can imagine, he suffered greatly. He saw many of his loved ones die. His mother was gassed and killed. His father was dying of starvation and pneumonia, and his father asked him to put him out of his misery. So just imagine that. You're in the camps, and, and you're working. as a, he, he was still working as a psychiatrist, so he had access to medications and like morphine. And the father's like, I'm dying, and can you just put me out of my misery? And then he did. He, you know, Victor stole some morphine and administered it. His wife, pregnant, was forced to have an abortion, and she eventually died in the camp. So he's all alone. And he, his wife, his unborn child, his, his mother, his father, all the other people that he knew, and just so much death and so much suffering. And in this moment, he saw himself and others in terms of how they responded to the horror that was going around, on around them. And there were a lot of people that just died from starvation or illness or pneumonia or even suicide. Many people died from suicide. And what he noticed was in all this death, like daily, he noticed that when people had meaning in their life, then they tended to not be as sick and they tended to survive longer. Those people who took life you know, by the horns seemed to hold on longer. They still might get killed because the Nazis would just arbitrarily kill people. But he noticed that if you had a – not necessarily a positive outlook, and I'll get into more into that in a second, but just purpose, meaning, you know, something that got you up in the morning. And you might say to yourself, well, what possible meaning could you have to your life when you're – stuck in one of these camps. Well, I'll get into that too as well for him. And he he saw that, uh, well, so what he decided to do was he decided his purpose was he was going to write about it. He was pretty sure he was going to get killed, but, but he tried to believe he was going to live and he tried to figure out, okay, well, what am I, what can I do? Well, what, what, what I can do is I can sneak a little pen or a little you know, a little pencil, tiny little bits of paper because they weren't allowed to have those things. And uh, he's going to write, he's going to start writing his manuscript about what he's observing and about suicide and about positivity and about meaning and purpose. And by some sort of miracle, he survived. Only 3% of people survived living in the camps, but he survived. And he's, he believed after the war that he survived partially because he had found meaning and purpose, that he had managed to stave off despair and meaninglessness and suicide and illness because he had a purpose in his life, which is to actually write about how we all need a purpose in our life. 1946, after the war, he immediately published his book called Man's Search for Meaning. Originally, it was called I Say Yes to Life. But then it was later changed to Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, most therapists of my generation have this 
small paperback on their shelf. It's one of the go-to books that all therapists read. And just one of the quotes from the book. Everything can be taken from a man, but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude. Sorry, I read that funny. <laughs> Essentially, you know, you can take you can take everything from someone, but you can never take away the freedom to choose their attitude. Now, this sounds like positive thinking, you know, just think positive and that that isn't really what it is. It, it's more of a recognition of the of your existence. It's a recognition of life is suffering and to fight against the suffering is to be irrational. So you have to accept that life is suffering. And he saw that in very acute ways when he was in the camps. And he said, but we are all responsible for doing what we can do within that suffering to find our purpose while we are here on this planet suffering. And we're only here for a limited amount of time. And we all need to accept that. But we are the only people who can decide and find and enact what our purpose in life is. The other thing that he said was, and he was a very charismatic, interesting speaker. And sometimes he kind of annoys me, to be honest. <laughs> and actually, he, I, when I talked to Irvin Yalom, whom some of you might know, uh, he's a hero of mine. I had him on the podcast. Irvin Yalom actually talked to Viktor Frankl and found him to be not so nice. I can't remember what he said. But anyway, uh, he's he's kind of an abrasive person, but he had some interesting things to say. And, and, I, and, I, th- and I can appreciate it. And the, the thing that, that he would really emphasize as he would talk, he would say things like, well, it, you are responsible for doing your purpose. You can – Just say to yourself, I found my purpose. But unless you actually do your purpose, then you're not, you you didn't really find your purpose. You know, for an example, might be someone might say, My purpose in life is to become a musician. And, uh, and yet that person never plays music or they very rarely will play the piano or sing or play, you know, they, they, in their intellect, they're saying, my purpose in life is X, Y, and Z. But if the person never actually does the purpose, then it's just an intellectual idea. Uh, Viktor Frankl was very adamant that purposes and meaning in life was an action. It wasn't a thought. It was something that you did. For me, for example, this podcast is a part of the action of me living my purpose. You know, I find my purpose. I realize my purpose and meaning in life through this podcast by conveying information so that people can have compassion for others, for themselves, and make a positive difference in the world. And if I just sat around saying, I'm going to maybe one day do that because that's my purpose, or you know what? My purpose in life is to try to make a positive difference in the world, and I didn't really do anything along those lines. It's not really a purpose. You're just you're just saying things to yourself. Anyway, listen to my whole deep dive, 2017. So, uh, getting back to Bronwyn's questions, you know, I want to hear why some people maintain sanity during enormous hardship. Well, Bronwyn, according to Viktor Frankl, anyway, and I might agree, I've never been through the things that Viktor Frankl went through, even in the, the tiniest of, of degrees. But, uh, but I do agree, seemingly, that when we have purpose in life, it really gets us through some dif- difficult times. Now, it might not reduce the suffering, which I think sometimes is a m- mistake to interpret it that way, that, that it, you know, when people have purpose in their life, for example, me, if, you know, when I, I pretty much every day I'm, I'm living my purpose in my life, that doesn't mean that I don't suffer. <laughs> it just means that it contextualizes the suffering within a greater meaning. It gives that gives the suffering a purpose. You know, it for me to suffer in my life. While I'm suffering, I'm probably not thinking very much about my purpose. I'm probably just thinking about how life sucks and that I'm suffering. But when the suffering subsides a little bit, I can say to myself, well, I went through that suffering 
time because I have a greater purpose. There's a reason for me to wake up in the morning and, and keep going. There's a reason for me to, to keep trying and keep at it because I believe. There, there's a hopeful message in there. There's a belief. There's an, I guess there's an optimism in a sense, but it's not. Again, I hope people understand, and maybe I'm explaining it badly, but I hope people understand this isn't just thinking positive. That, that was not what Viktor Frankl was saying. He wasn't just like, well, just think positive. You know, like to think positive would just be like, well, I'm suffering today, but surely tomorrow I won't be suffering. Well, that's delusional because you probably will suffer tomorrow. What Viktor Frankl was saying was have a purpose, have meaning, do something, do something to enact your purpose, whatever that is. Your purpose in life could finish a sculpture or to raise your children or to finally get that book published or some other thing or spreading laughter or something or to have the most amazing tweet. It doesn't matter. And, and that's the thing is there's no judgment about what people decide, what their purpose is. As long as they're living it, then they will be able to carry on. It'll, it gives us meaning. It gives us uh, the ability to carry on through so much difficulty. And uh, you know me, I'm frequently talking about the meaning of life and I will flat out ask clients. Sometimes I, I find that We'll be talking about something, and, and I just it just emerges in me this question. I'll just say like, okay, well, I'm going to ask a question kind of out of left field. What is the meaning of your life? Why are you here? And it's such a weird question, but it's so important. People, for example, will be suffering in their career. For example, they'll be just I don't know what I'm doing. I'm, you know, I got into this job and I, I, I'm sort of depressed and. I don't know if I like this job that much, but I kind of like it and it pays the bills. And I don't know. I just, it just, I don't know what to do. And uh, some people might, uh, you know, proceed in the conversation of like, well, let's find a job that is good for you. And there's nothing wrong with that. But a more fundamental question to explore is, well, why are you on this planet? Because your career has at least something to do with the purpose of your life. Now, let me explain. Like for me, my job does have to do very much with the purpose of my life. And I very much made that conscious decision when I was 24 years old. I said, okay, what is the purpose of my life? Why am I on this planet? And I sort of already knew that prior to 24. And I was enjoying my job at a business. I, was a mar I had a marketing degree and really didn't know much about marketing, to be honest. But I was hired as a research, uh, research market, market research position, you know, where you poll customers about their preferences and then you report to the product so that they can further refine their product. And it, I was a manager, you know, a project manager and, and at the age of 23. And I thought, you know, I kind of like this job. It's interesting. And I get to do all these really interesting things, focus groups and and testing out new doodads like uh, VR headsets. I was testing out VR headsets in the early 90s. And, it, you know, it was, it was interesting. And I, I saw myself enjoying the job. But I thought, is this the meaning of my life? Is this the purpose of my life? I like the job, but am I really in my purpose? Am I really doing what I'm supposed to be doing? And I concluded no, and so I thought for a bit, and I thought, you know what, what would, what what job would be? Because if I'm going to spend a, a third of my life now, that's me. Another person can decide for themselves. You know what, my job, I, it, my job has nothing to do with the purpose of my life. Uh, but being uh, this job doesn't interfere with the purpose of my life. This job facilitates the purpose. You know, maybe one person's. Uh, purpose in life is to be able to go camping uh, and live, be in the outdoors, hiking, long excursions, these kinds of things. That's the purpose of their life. Well, you need to still pay the bills. It's hard to make money camping. You know, it's hard to make money hiking. There are ways, but, you know, it's hard. And so someone might say, you know what, my job at the bank is not the purpose of my life, but it does afford me to live the purpose of my life. So, 
those are very important things. And the problem in our society is these questions almost never get asked. I would guess, I don't know, that 99% of kids in school are never asked by a teacher, why are you on this planet? It's such a fundamental question that people need to know about themselves. You know, there should be at least modules throughout one's schooling as a child of how do you connect with the purpose of your life? You'll have classes on what career should you have, but not a question of what's the purpose of your, why are you here? Because it starts to dip into religion, but it doesn't have to. You notice I've been talking it thus far and I haven't mentioned anything about religion. Anyway, that's the end of that topic. I hope that answers your question, Bronwyn. There's a lot of other things I could be talking about, but that's what I wanted to talk about was Viktor Frankl and how he persevered. He's another hero in addition to Amanda Berry and Jerry Conlon. And he also came up with a form of therapy that had to do with how we all persevere through difficulty. All right, let's take a break. When we get back, I'll read another email. Okay, this email is from anonymous upper tier patron. She writes, I am a registered nurse. One thing that amazes me is the power of stigma, in particular, the stigma associated with genital herpes. As a nurse, I know that there are many factors that contribute to the stigma of herpes. The media, the movie industry, it is viewed and depicted as a gross and shameful affliction experienced by the promiscuous. It is more prevalent than many people know. Oral herpes is more prevalent but carries much less stigma, which is weird. I've had herpes for 25 years. I have been dating with it after my divorce. It's really sad to see the extent of the trauma experienced by people with herpes. They feel a tremendous amount of guilt and shame, a sense of feeling dirty and unwanted. They feel their love and their sex life are over. Many experience periods of depression, and I've seen some voice suicidal ideations. I was elated when the whole alleged Usher has herpes thing came out in the media. I wanted so bad for him to just say, yeah, I have it, so what? So here are my questions. What has been your experience with it in your practice, the stigma of herpes? How do stigmas develop? What are some things that we can do to dismantle the stigma? End of email. So I, I didn't know about the Usher story, and I looked into it, read a few articles, and in a nutshell, a number of women accused Usher. If you don't know who Usher is, he's a pop star from 20 years ago. <laughs> a number of women accused Usher of infecting them with herpes after having sex with them, unprotected sex. And there were lawsuits of some sort. And Usher's lawyers said that the women assumed any risks that you know happened when they consented to having unprotected sex with him. So they're like, look, you had unprotected sex with them, so you assume any of the risks thereof. And that they might have even been given herpes by a different sexual partner that, you know, just because they have herpes and they had sex with Usher doesn't mean that they didn't get herpes from someone else, even if Usher does have herpes. Now, I don't know if Usher admitted having herpes, but anyway. So that's what I know about that story. I don't know. I'm sure there's more details, but all right. So let's talk about uh, herpes, STIs in general, I suppose, and stigma. The first thing I'll say is the ethics in that y'all should get tested periodically, particularly if you're having sex with new people, shall we say, and tell your sexual partners about if you, you know, so you get, if you get text, if you get tested periodically, you'll know if you have something. And then of course, tell your sexual partners about your STIs before engaging in any activity that could put the other person at risk. Makes sense. It's obvious. And also, if you're told that someone has herpes, I recommend not completely freaking out because of the overblown stigma about it. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to proceed with the relationship, but it, 
your initial reaction might be a little overblown because of the misinformation that has been pumped into your head, which I'll go into in a second. So, so ethically speaking, tell people before putting them at risk. And if someone tells you, you know, if, if you don't have herpes and someone tells you they have herpes, then there's options to reduce your risk. Anyway, uh, there's, there's no way to eliminate the risk, by the way, but um, anyway. So yeah, stigma, it's just awful. I, I've seen it in clients before that suicide is an option that a lot of people consider. Someone is, has never thought about suicide. They realize they have herpes, genital herpes, and suddenly for the first time in their life, you know, age 35, they're thinking about killing themselves. That's how much stigma there is around having herpes in particular. People feel isolated. They, they're terrified of disclosing it. And I've had clients that would tell me similar things that you know you were hearing, uh, anonymous patron who was a nurse. Um, people saying, you know what? I guess now my love life is over. I guess I'm never going to be able to have sex with anyone else. I guess I'm never going to be able to date ever again. And this is just not true. It's just, it's an unfortunate result. Now, the reason why I have to remind people that they should tell people before engaging in risky behavior, you know, i.e., you know, genital contact, is because people will lie about it. They'll, they won't disclose it. Now, why do people not disclose it? It's not because they're psychopaths. It's because, not usually, it's because we have created such an overblown idea about what herpes is that it it terrifies individuals to one disclose it to other people but sometimes two to even acknowledge it to themselves i mean the stigma is so overwhelming that some people will go into denial about the fact that they even have it and it and it's not like a conscious choice and i've seen that before too we create such a weight of stigma on people that it creates problems that result in people not being able to get help and not being able to disclose it, and thus it gets spread, you know, further. Anyway, years ago, I don't know, ten years ago or so, a student of mine approached me and asked if I could participate in a convention for people with STIs called Simplex. I don't know if it happens anymore, but it was—it's basically a, a convention that brings together people who have STIs so that. They can meet other people with STIs and they can get advice about what to do and they can talk openly about how the fact that they have an STI because they can't talk openly outside of this conference. And my student asked me to be on this on a panel because I'm a couples therapist to talk about how to disclose to your partner that you have a STI of some sort. And it was very interesting because uh, I, I, I didn't know about this um, community, essentially, a community of people who support each other at, in, because they're all being targeted internally and externally by the stigma. All right. So let's talk about herpes just very briefly, because I think it's important to understand it before talking about the stigma, because if you don't understand it, you might have some strange ideas about it. Uh, a caveat, I'm not a biologist or a medical professional, so yeah, everything I'm about to say is th through that lens. But So herpes, uh, simplex uh, one or two, one is usually associated with oral uh, herpes and two is usually associated with genital herpes. Um, it's a virus similar to chicken pox, shingles, or mono. Um, it's a similar virus. And... The herpes virus has been in, been with humans for millions of years. It's just one of those things that's sort of made its way through human populations for millions of years. It doesn't once you catch it, uh, generally speaking, it doesn't go away. It it stays in your body. It's not like a different virus that will that your immune system will be able to completely get rid of. It it sticks around potentially the rest of your life, and. When you have outbreaks, they call them, they're blisters or swords. They're, they're basically a, a rash of various different sizes. For some people, it can be an open sore the size of a coin. And other people, it'll be tiny little imperceptible um, 
blisters. And it's usually periodic. You know, once every so often, people will have these these rashes that will break out either on their genitals or on their torso, obviously on their mouth if they're having cold sores. And many people are asymptomatic. And will some, after being symptomatic, will become asymptomatic. And this is one of the reasons why it spreads pretty easily is because a lot of people will have it. They don't even know it. And they're transmitting it. with. They don't know they're supposed to be telling other people because they're not being tested often enough. There are meds that can suppress the rash. And, of course, if you, are, if you have questions about this, talk with your physician about it. All right. So I hope by the way I describe it that, it, that it's essentially a rash that can be basically anywhere in your body. I mean, there are places where it tends to show up. And, you know, there's strains that tend to show up on your face. There are strains that tend to show up in your genitals. And then there sometimes it just shows up anywhere. Um, so, uh, so yeah, uh, it, because I say this because I'm a product of the American sex ed program, <laughs> meaning that when I grew up taking sex ed in fifth grade and then ninth grade and whatever, uh, I was shown all the horrific pictures of what seemed to be just like bullet wounds or, you know, people's l- limbs falling off. In fact, in magazines, it was called the leprosy of the 80s or something. And it, that's really just taking it a little far. <laughs> now, I, I guess people are free to see it how they want to see it, but I find it to be pretty exaggerated. And if it were an innocuous exaggeration, then fine. But this exaggeration literally causes people to want to kill themselves. In fact, I don't know the stats, but I'm, I suspect there's a good amount of people who kill themselves every year because they come down with herpes. And they have all those voices inside of them telling them that they're disgusting and they're worthless and that no one will ever want to be with them ever again. And they have a permanent mark against them. You know, these are very powerful messages that people aren't born with, that we inject into people's heads. We brainwash all of ourselves. You know, we're brainwashing ourselves to believe that to have herpes is essentially a death sentence. Now, let's talk about the prevalence. It varies by country, but in the United States, statistics kind of vary widely because you'd have to test everyone, and some, sometimes these are self-reported. But essentially, after the age of 40, because you know by the age of 40, you, you've had more sexual partners than, say, when you're 15, about a third of people will eventually get genital herpes. A third of people. It's more prevalent with women than with men, uh, so there's that. But uh, and there are differences by ethnicity, by the way, which I won't go into. But uh, generally speaking, if you just sort of walk away with a general prevalence estimate, uh, by a certain age, about one fifth uh, or one fourth to one third, one one fourth to one third of people. So a lot of people, you know, that's. That's, that's a lot of people who have genital herpes. Now, I'm not saying this is good. <laughs> I'm saying we should be doing what we can to reduce that number. We should be trying to have protected sex more often. We should be getting tested. We should you know, do what we can. Uh, the rash isn't a welcomed thing in people's lives. Uh, it'd be nice if you know, these people didn't have to suffer in this way. Uh, but it's not a reason to consider suicide. It's not a reason to believe your sex life is over. That's my point. It's not a good thing. Herpes isn't a good thing. I'm not, I'm not, you know, it's not a good thing, but it, it, on the scale of things that, I don't know, once you really understand herpes, like the nurse who wrote in, it's not as big of a deal as people make it out to be. Okay. So, um, the anonymous upper tier patron asked a number of questions, you know, why is there stigma? Well, it's hard to know why anything is anything because, you know, humans and society and psychology, but some general speculations that I and other experts might have would be that we've had centuries 
centuries of ostracizing and stigmatizing people for having any kind of sex, particularly in what we call the Victorian uh, cultures like the United States, um, Queen Victoria of England. Uh, ha- I won't go into the – I don't know the history that well, but um, there was a, a movement essentially of fundamentalism and moralism and and – uh, being very uptight, <laughs> that actually Freud emerged out of and was just like, uh, by the way, y'all like to act like you don't think about sex, but boy, do you think about sex a lot. And that was essentially why he became so popular because he, every, he was express, he was talking openly about something that everyone was thinking about. Anyway, so we've had centuries, particularly in the last couple hundred years, of uh, people in Western society – in the United States, England, uh, Britain, of sex negativity. That's what we call it, sex negativity. It's everywhere. And I won't go into the whole discussion of sex negativity, but I hope you know what I'm saying by it. And thus, if sex is bad and sex is dirty and having sex with multiple people makes you a disgusting person, then surely having a disease from having sex must mean you're ultra disgusting, right? So that's, you know, one reason is just a culture of anti-sex and sex negativity. Uh, Second reason for the stigma is education programs that emerge out of that culture. As I was talking about earlier, you know, I'm a product of typical American sex ed. And it, uh, you know, when you hear the term sex education, you think, oh, okay. Like if you don't know, you think, oh, okay, I'm going to learn about sex. I'm going to learn about all the different things about sex. And sure, STIs are a part of it, but you know, in terms of the average everyday life of humans when it comes to sex, uh, STIs is, you know, it's a it's a topic, but it's not something that people usually think about that much. Um, that you know, there are things that people should learn about STIs in terms of protecting themselves and not spreading things, but you know, sex is wonderful. Sex is bonding. Sex feels good. Sex provides people meaning in their lives. Sex is creative and attachment, you know, uh, facilitating. And it creates life. And there's beauty and art and songs and poems and Sex is a wonderful thing. And yeah, STIs, which are horrible. So let's, you know, let's have a chapter on STIs, but surely it's not the whole book. Well, a lot of sex education is 90% about STIs. So just think about, I, and I know this firsthand because I was contracted by a local school district, public school district to be in charge of their sex ed program. And I spent a lot of time trying to figure out, okay, what, as a family therapist, do I think ninth graders, uh, age appropriate, what do they need to know about sex? Well, they're, some of them are already having sex. Some of them have yet to engage in any kind of sexual activity. So, yeah, STIs, for sure. Pregnancy, for sure. But also self-esteem, sex positivity, uh, knowing how to talk about sex with your partner um, and so on, you know, all those kinds of sexual expression, body positivity. When I brought up those things, they were, I, I was in charge of this program for, I don't know, 12 years or something. So there's a lot of ups and downs, but generally speaking, anything that diverged away from uh, STIs was shot down by parents and by the school district and by teachers. Everyone was terrified. And it was weird because when I would talk with the teachers, they all agreed with me. They're all like, oh yeah, that sounds good. Because these are rational people. The teachers are rational human beings. But everyone was so terrified of getting in trouble that we all just, not me, we, meaning they all landed on this policy of, well, let's just stick to the safe uh, uh, topics, which is STIs. You're never going to get in trouble or I don't know, you're rarely going to get in trouble from parents if you, if your sex ed class is wall to wall STI talk, <laughs> you know, whereas you worry that you might get in trouble. And by the way, there were years when uh, we would have part of the program sex positivity and 
and the other to- you know the the meaningful topics and no parent ever complained i ne- no parent ever complained but the paranoia about parents complaining now i'm not saying that parents wouldn't complain but i'm just saying that at, there's this gravitation towards the safest common denominator, which is STIs. And so uh, you have a whole slew of people um, who their only education when it comes to sex is that STIs are awful, uh, life-ending things that are disgusting and that picture that we saw on the, you know, on the screen when I was in sex ed in the ninth grade, it, you know, it just makes sex look disgusting and promiscuity is terrible and you know, abstinence is the only way and, you know, all these kinds of things. And so, so I, you know, the way we do education now, of course, there are shining beacons of sex positivity education programs in high school. So that's happening and it's ever increasing. Uh, in fact, I think in Washington State, I just voted uh, for a proposition that was to set up more sex positivity in, in um, sex education. Anyway, um, the third reason is f- there is basically no effort to destigmatize STIs in our society. Uh, there are little blips here and there, but you know, when you think about gay pride, for example, well, that is a movement of activism that started uh, under threat of death and still is to some extent, but uh, of raising awareness that, hey, gay people are here and they're fine. Don't worry about them, you know? And also to fellow gay people of like, we can have pride, (laughs) you know, like we can stand tall at least one day of the year in one neighborhood. And there's no movement like that for people with STIs. There are minor things, like I said, but there, you know, LGBTQIA people were stigmatized. They still are. And there, but there's a political movement. There's uh, politicians who run partially on the notion, hey, I'm a gay senator or I'm a gay representative, you know, and I stand for gay rights. I'm going to vote for da, da, da. There's no politicians talking about you know, I stand up for the rights of people with herpes. Even the notion sounds ludicrous because of how stupid and how sex negative we are. <laughs> like, why is that? Especially, okay, so let's just look at the stats. That again, I, about a fourth or a third, you know, let's go on the low end, a fourth of people uh, eventually will have genital herpes. So that means of the 100 senators, 25 of them, law of averages, have genital herpes. Uh, of all of the people you know, if you're 40 years old, uh, one out of four of them have have herpes, genital herpes. And genital herpes has been around a long time. So don't think like, well, my parents can't have genital herpes. Oh, yes, they can. <laughs> genital herpes had a, a surge uh, decades ago, but anyone over, I don't know, 55 or 65, uh, anyone, sorry, anyone younger than 65 is of the group of people. And st- stats come out about how genital herpes goes through older people pretty quickly as they get divorced or there are you know widows and widowers, they s- start to date and, and it's actually kind of a problem. So uh, a lot of people have it. And yet the... It's stigma. No one stands up and says, I have herpes and I'm going to stand up and say it's okay. And I'm responsible about it. And it doesn't make me a leper. And I still enjoy a love life and a romance life. And, you know, the nurse that wrote in, she was hoping that Usher would just say that, that Usher would just be like, yeah, you know what? I have herpes. And, um, you know, I'm sorry that I had unprotected sex. I shouldn't have done that. It's just a terrible, terrible thing that I did. But I, but I was worried no one would love me because, you know, just we need someone. And maybe someone already has, and I just don't know about it. But uh, clearly we don't have enough. So that's the third reason. There's a, there, we got education programs. We have centuries of ostracization in certain societies and cultures. And we have seemingly no effort to destigmatize. The fourth reason is 
everyone who has it or the vast majority of people who have it do not come forward and say that they have it. In order for the gay rights movement to get moving, gay people had to stand up and say, I'm gay. They had to publicly announce, by the way, I'm gay. Look at me. I'm, I'm here and I'm fine. And I'm not a monster. <laughs> the way that you're, you think gay people are, you know, look at me. And then we're going to do a march or we're going to stand tall together. Herpes, people with herpes aren't doing that. You know, the stigma is so severe that no one will admit it. Now, I think some people do, but anyway, the point is it's not enough, right? Fifth reason is, as I was saying earlier, there's a complete misunderstanding of herpes and its effects. That it's, it's a bad thing. It, it sucks for people that have herpes, you know, to have the rash. Um, it's bad. And it, it does hinder your life, right? Because you have to take a lot of precautions and, and whatnot. Um, and there can be complications, you know, rare complications from having it, but there can be complications from what I understand. Again, I'm not a medical professional, but, but it's not as bad as people think. And so uh, because of the misinformation that has been propagated and – it's not just sex ed. It's also like Time Magazine and other major publications uh, writing about herpes, particularly in previous decades, talking about it as literally like leprosy, uh, equating it to leprosy. Anyway, not to stigmatize leprosy. Plenty of people have leprosy and live fine lives. Anyway, and the last reason why there's stigma that I could speculate is that um, there's a – group of people in our in every society perhaps but i could talk about my society a group of people who hate the idea of premarital sex they hate the idea of having sex outside of marriage they hate the idea of you know having sex with anyone aside from the person that you eventually marry and stis and herpes in particular provide a very convenient um, flag of terribleness that they can wave to one, scare people away in their congregation from premarital sex, but also to condemn those who have had premarital sex. Uh, so they will say, you know, this herpes is evidence that God is punishing those people who are having premarital sex, that kind of thing. And you don't want to have the mark of the devil on your body, on your genitals. So don't have premarital sex, you know, that kind of talk. And so there, there's a lot of motivated stigmatizers, if you will, in, in our society. Anyway, so yeah, getting back to your questions, anonymous patron, um, what has been my experience in my practice? I think I talked about that. How do stigmas develop? I think I talked about that. What are some ways we can dismantle the stigma? Okay, well, one thing we can do is, for me, I'm talking about it. <laughs> you know, I, I'm saying let's... Let's bring it out in the open, you know? Let's talk about it in a rational way. And I guess by statistics, a good number of you listening right now uh, know or don't know, well, a good number of you people listening right now have genital herpes. And of those people who have genital herpes, a percentage of you know about it and a percentage of you don't know about it. And so uh, I don't know why I'm saying that, but just as another, <laughs> another example of of statistics and prevalence. But anyway, um, what can we do? Well, we can talk about it. We can all bring it up. We can create organizations. And maybe there is an organ. Actually, I should probably look at There's got to be one. Okay, so a quick search here. I came up with Herpes Virus Association. There's probably others, but the, it's Herpes Virus Association. And they on the front page, it says genital herpes. It's not what you think. It is misunderstood. But having it is normal. We help people to get the facts straight. Uh, so th they can donate money. There's probably organizations. There's people who step forward who you know are on the site saying, I have herpes, that kind of thing. And they have another stat here that says that uh, among the various strains of herpes, 70% of people will eventually have herpes uh, sooner or later, so whether it's uh, you know type 1 or type 2. So most people will have at least one of the strains of herpes and they're stuck with it <laughs> from, from what I understand. Anyway, so, so there are organizations for sure. And, and so I don't want to 
act like there's not. Um, I'm just not aware of it because it, it's just. I guess I just didn't bother to look. But <laughs> but again, they're they're not big enough. You know what I mean? And 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 people aren't uh, turning to them enough. And the reason why is because of just the massive amounts of stigma around this. Anyway. All right. Well, that does it for that episode. The final word today is to think about all the things that you have absorbed, different indoctrinations, different brainwashing injections into your brain throughout your life that have given you a spin on things that might, you know, need some questioning. You know, you we've all probably in, been brainwashed to believe that herpes is essentially a death sentence to your love life or something. That's something that we weren't born with. It was something that was injected into us from society, from movies, from sex ed, this, from others around us. There are, so, there are so many things like this, ideas about race, ideas about accent, ideas about um, being an undocumented person, right? Being an illegal alien, um, ideas about someone who has a mental illness, quote unquote, ideas about, I don't know, gender and just all these kinds of things. And some of these things are useful and some of them are not. And some of them are downright destructive. And so let's all, let's all do our part and not point it out in other people, but think about it for ourselves. You know, just take note. What am I doing? What am I, what story am I telling myself about people? I, I, here's, here's maybe a very direct question to answer, which is think about someone that you just don't like. Okay. You don't know that well. So someone you don't know that well, someone you just met at work or something, just think about that person, you know, just identify that person. It's like someone you, someone at church, a friend of a friend, whatever. Okay. You don't like that person. Now, maybe that person is an unlikable human being, but there's a possibility that you don't like that person based on stigma that you have internalized. Some narrative about whatever that person shows up as that tells you, you know what, that person's a threat and thus I don't like them. That is an opportunity to maybe be a jumping off point of like, huh, I wonder if I, wonder if I have a weird narrative about that group of people. I wonder if I need to question that a little bit. And the path forward is asking, is, you know, being curious, sort of putting that narrative aside temporarily. Maybe the narrative's good. Maybe it's useful. Maybe it's accurate. But put it aside. Do some research. You know, uh, go on the internet, look at some stories, expose yourself to more of those people, hearing more of their experiences. Maybe the narrative is wrong. And maybe the narrative is limiting you. All right, everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do. 